I'm quite short up. Take a seat first. Class shorter, is it? Bibi, remember me? Rani, pump at 10 secondary. You and track and fill together. Every time we had a reunion, we tried to invite you, but no one had your contact. Is this your salon? Yeah, I took over after my mother passed away. The back and the side shorter? Yeah, can. You must come for the reunions. Remember Marjorie? She's married with a kid. DB is working for HDB. And Wailing is in the US getting her PhD. Come, watch first. I guess among all of us, I'm the most boring one. I'm teaching at Mountbatten. English. But I'm also coaching. Track and field. Have you been keeping up with your throwing? Shoot. You really should. You were the most promising one among all of us. Miss Menon always used to say that when she was coaching us. You remember Miss Menon, right? She retired three years ago. I took over her position. It's really fun, you know, coaching the girls. Reminds me of us when we were young. Actually, I'm looking for another coach to help me. Interested? I don't do sports anymore. One now. Wow, 新年快樂。Yeah, Young Girl with Discus was made in 1961 by Liu Kang. And it really shows a girl in the act of throwing a discus. Through this painting, you can really see Liu Kang's skill in portraying figures and also his skill in using pastels. It's really that moment that he was able to capture so, so vibrantly, I guess, and so energetically. My thoughts just goes back to the days where I followed my mum to St. Teresa's Convent and saw their first sports day. And the girls were dressed with high-waisted shorts, exactly like that and throwing the discus. But of course, everybody had to duck because the discus went in many different directions. But it was my first experience of a sports day. I was only in primary four or five. I went to primary school in Pasir Panjang. Sports was a big thing. So let me give you a feeling of our sports day in the primary school. The field is decorated and so on. And then at one corner, there will be huge flagpoles put up. And there will be three coloured footballs. This is to denote the three different houses. To so green house, red house and yellow house. After every two events, you see the balls changing places from top to the middle to the bottom. I realised that, oh, 
when my house got more points, the green ball will be up. And the points were noted on a blackboard. A huge blackboard by the side, and then there's a teacher in charge of writing the points. And so from, from a distance, you could see the points, as well as which house was in the lead. There were so many races, the 100, the 200. They had hurdles, they had high jump, they had long jump. But for me, because I was a small fellow, I was not selected for anything. But if you consider the sack relay or the egg and spoon relay as one athletic event, then I was in it. In those days, schools, they just concentrated, I think, in track and field because that was what was most convenient, I guess, you know with the fields and all that were available. It was quite actively participated in. Community Centre will organise something in the weekends. Cross country, big walk racing. So it's your choice where you want to go and participate. In fact, to be honest with you, we will see the prizes before we <laughs> go and compete. The other popular sports were definitely hockey as well as badminton. Because don't forget, there was Wong Ping Soon. I remember even as a young child going and watching at the badminton hall, just scintillating matches that went on, you know, between Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia. Well, at that time there was no television, but we used to listen on Radio Fusion. So we used to listen, you know, to the matches, especially when Wong Ping Soon was playing. Oh, we used to be all years, you know, to find out whether he how he fed, you know, and whenever he won, there was a big loud cheer in our place, you know, in our house. Ong Po Lim, truth be told, was born in Sarawak, right? He's not a Singaporean, but he came to Singapore. He was Hutch rival to Wong Ping Soon. He created a novel way of service. People were saying, Hey, we've never seen this type of service before. You know when you hold the racket this way and you do that instead of this way, underarm, yeah? Crocodile service, the crocodile sir. Why crocodile? Because he came from the land of crocodiles, from Sarawak. When I was a kid, my father, he used to take me to watch soccer matches, boxing, wrestling, because uh, in, in those days there was a person called King Kong. We used to go to watch him wrestling maybe every five or six months. So people who say sports was low profile and all that, yeah, I said no. Where I was growing up, in the village, in the Ulu place, sports was big time. During the 50s, 60s and 70s, there was absolute wonderful following for sports in general. Not just participating, but watching it. Attending matches at the stadium and things like that. Just to go there. And I, I remember my young days, you know, talking with my friends and we spent hours talking about uh, whatever sport that is uh, highlighted for that day and all that. And that inspired us to want to take part in sports. You know, when we start talking about all these, you know, we want to, we, we want to be there. We want to experience it ourselves. Stations, practice on your own. Interested? You're interested enough to come here? Why don't you try it out for a few weeks first? See how you like it. I need to be at a salon. Close it for a while. Not so easy. Plus, I haven't done sports for a very long time. I, I've forgotten everything already. It's like riding a bicycle, baby. 
You never forget. Surely you remember how happy you were in track and field. Come, I want to show you something. That's Mui Fong. Give that runner. She has the potential to go national in a few years if she trains hard. But her parents want to pull her out of athletics because she's not doing well in maths. That city. Discus stroller, like you. Her family is under financial pressure and they want her to work after school instead of training. You're telling me this for what? I can't help them. You can. Maybe you can. You were a leader back in secondary school. I remember you helping teammates who had problems at home so that they could attend training. That was a long time ago. I need to go. In 1973, we celebrated the birth of our national stadium. And it was the first time that uh, we hosted the SEA Games in Singapore. There was a lot of expectancy in the air, you know, not only to see our athletes do well, but to see this, you know, this wonderful stadium that would eventually be the home of the Kalang Wave. So in 1973, I was a student, secondary one. Dad made sure that we got to watch as many sports as possible, either on TV or he took us down uh, to the actual site. And there's C. Kunalan, Asian Games silver medalist, running on lane number seven. The stadium was packed. Not one standing room left. The spectators began to throw their sun visors. Doom, doom, doom. And I'm telling myself, wow, if these things hit the torch, what, what's going to happen? And I said, okay, never mind, just stay calm, keep going. I was at the stadium all day because I was commentating on athletics, and our athletes did not let them down. You know, they did very well. At that time, we had champions in every event. I remember watching Helen Marikan hurdling and Gan Biwa, and you know, they just wowed me, just Helen Marikan, you know. She's, she just looks uh, like a celebrity, right? So well-groomed, etc., and an athlete. The lady who won the very first gold medal for Singapore was Heather Marikan, and uh, she won the 200 meters hurdles. And then we had Glory Barnabas, well, way back in 1973, I was about 31 years old. I was a PE teacher and I was training hard for the SEA Games just, just around the corner. Previous years, I had been winning bronzes and silvers. The gold was always away from me, eluding me. I was entered for the 200 meters and the 4 by one meters relay. And I told myself, I can't let my Singaporeans down. I want to sing the Majula Singapore. I want to be on top of the roster when I receive my prize. All these thoughts were getting on in my head even as I was preparing. Glory ran the race of her life and you can see it, you know, on her face. At that very moment, I said, okay, I'm watching now. I hope one day I can run in this track, that particular national stadium track. Round the bend, she was trailing this girl, Tantan. Tantan had the edge. In the last 50 meters, I just took quick breaths and moved up as fast as I could. Then I could see I had caught up with her just before the finish. And I just lunged forward to press the tape. It was a neck-to-neck -neck finish, so we didn't know who was the winner. This lady was from Burma, Tan Tan. Everybody expected her to win, but glory upset her. I stood up and I cried. It's emotional. It's emotional. Knowing that our girl rose to the occasion for the nation and she won. She not only won the event, 
she won the hearts of all Singaporeans. Can you imagine, you know, stadium of about maybe 50,000 people rising to the occasion and, you know, bursting into applause and shouting and, you know, and calling her name and then shouting, Singapore, go! That was really something to behold. In those days, there's one, one common statement that even I, as a student, you should hear almost every month. It's that Singapore is a cultural desert. I think my father, he, he cared about that. He just wanted, for whatever limited capability he had, he wanted to push a desert away. He cared a lot about educating the young people. In fact, he was my art teacher as well. Liu Kang wasn't just an artist, he was a part-time teacher at Chongqing High School, Nanyang Girls and Chinese High. Eventually, he became a full-time teacher at Dunman High School. He also opened a studio that teaches students art. He was born around the time of the post-impressionist. So he was under a lot of influence by Cezanne, Van Gogh, Gauguin, and a little bit later, Matisse. But on the Chinese side, because he also studied and taught in Shanghai, and made friends with many leading artists of that time, and learned a lot from them. He was very keen on promoting the Nanyang art, not just a pure Western or pure Chinese art, but voicing our own emotion and our own thinking, and also describing our own uh, landscape. I think one really key thing that comes out through his paintings were his attention to the everyday and how he would depict people in everyday settings, in communal settings the vitality and dynamism of life really comes out through his works. In those days, there wasn't really television. People really got out there and interacted. They sat around in the evening after having fed all their children and themselves, and they would just sit down and talk and yarn and talk about the day or whatever. What a life. Something we hanker after now. There were a lot of these lovely kampongs and these and these little little kids that were running around and just swimming in the sea. It wasn't a big deal. It was just something they did. So those days, all the children are outside playing, like uh, we play rounders, catching, uh, hantam bola. So during that sort of games or play. I think that has given me strength and also a kind of build up physically to bring me to this far. I know it is, that is the thing. I want to tell you a little bit about sailing. My school was just near the sea. Uh, you, you get off the bus along Pasir Panjang Road, you have the choice. You cross the road and go to school or you cross over to the beach. So it was very, uh, difficult decisions. But of course, you know, with parents, with canes waiting for you, you know where to go. But on Saturdays, wow, there was no school, but we would sometimes gather and then watch what was going on in the sea. Hey, 
，乐江啊，啊，不要紧啦，哎。Good morning, Miss Lee. Miss Rani told us to come here. Cikgu, tak boleh Cikgu. Kita semua tengah busy sekarang. Hari-hari kena kerja, tak ada rest pun. Siti, dia nak kena bantu kami. Alah, cuma tiga hari seminggu saja. Siti tu bagus dalam olahraga. Olahraga tu bukannya kita boleh makan, Cikgu. Dua hari seminggu? Tak boleh, cikgu. Tak nampak ke kita tengah sibuk ni? Satu hari seminggu. Dah. Terima kasih, cikgu. Tapi kita ni orang miskin. Kita nak kena kerja. Olahraga ni semua untuk orang kaya. Siti, jangan tercekak aja kat sana. Tolong, Mak. Kita nak kena hantar ni tau nanti. It's okay, Miss Lee. Cikgu! Cikgu kata Siti ni pelimpah cakera macam cikgu. Jadi cikgu boleh ajar dia buat macam ni lah. Bagus juga. Senang bila kita nak hantar surat khabar nanti, Abang. Correct. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You're good at multiplication but not division. I don't know how to do. I'll teach you. But you must listen carefully. And you must practice on your own when you go home. Okay? This is how much the salon made last month. Let's add up all the numbers. Then later, when you want to find out how much the salon made every day, you take the total, divide by 30. Understand? Understand? Let's add up the numbers first. Your hair salon don't make much money, huh? Where my family is concerned, my father was all for it. It was my mum who put her foot down and said, no, no, girls should actually stay at home and look after the home, the kids, the cooking, and so on and so forth. My mom wasn't too supportive, so she came one day to the school to tell one of the teachers that I'm anemic, I shouldn't uh, be taking part in too strenuous a sport. So that's how the teachers ganged up together, got round into buying butter and eggs for the, the team, the athletic team, you know, as such. So after that, my mom had to just seal her lips and not say anything further. <laughs> I find that thread running through teachers from the past right until now, because you know, I'm still in teaching. And teachers will do their damnedest for their kids. Every profession has the, the odd 5-10% who, who don't do that. 
but the majority of the teaching force in Singapore, I say is second to none in terms of their commitment to their profession, but more importantly, their commitment to the child. Oh, never. I was never a sports person. Never, never, never. I was made sports secretary of St. Teresa's Convent in the 60s, I think. And I went to the games room to check on the equipment. And I found all these hockey sticks lying around, which were used for PE only. And then I recalled that my husband was in charge of the SGI hockey team. And I used to follow him to all the games and cheer his boys up whenever they won. And I said to myself, why not hockey? And no, it was not part of their curriculum. Nobody asked me to do it, but I wanted it because I felt that here was a chance for the girls to blossom and for the school to get a name, you know, and be known for it. And so we came up quite well in the hockey. And uh, the parents also supported. Some of them would even come and watch the girls play. VK Children took hold of my team in 1974 early 73, 74. And we never looked back from 1974 until 1993. We were national champions in the B division for 16 years and we only lost it three times. Mr. VK Chalman, as coach, never accepted any money from us for payment for his services. But on his birthday, we would all do something for him. We'd collect some money buy him either a track shoes or something, a jersey or something and give him and have a little tea party. And I think he got great satisfaction by watching the girls blossom, by watching the girls use his skills. He himself was a good hockey player and I think that alone was enough for him. Coaches at that time were invested in sports because I think they already had another job. They were police officers. They were teachers, and so they were doing this for the country. In swimming, the big name was Dr. Chan Akao. He was a doctor running a clinic at the same time coaching. And then Tan Hui Hock. He was special now because Tan Hui Hock was an Asian Games gold medalist. And I tell you about this gold medal story. After he came back with that gold medal, they put the gold medal in a frame and put it in a tuck shop. And then we came down class by class, looking at the medal. Ooh. And then going to drink our milk. Tan Yu was the one who started the serious coaching program. He was the one who conducted so many courses for PE teachers and for athletics in particular. Actually, Tan Yu was a unique coach because he coached the high jumper, he coached the pole vaulter, he coached the javelin thrower, he coached the hurdlers, the shot putters, the hammer throwers. Every event except the distance and middle distance, he left that to Maurice Nicholas and others. K. Jayamani was Maurice Nicholas' protégé. And she comes from a very humble background. He was so concerned for Jayamani's welfare that he took her into his house to make sure that she's well-fed and that she gets her proper vitamins and what have you. For me, actually, personally, he has done a lot. Personally, he has done a lot and his wife. So actually, at one stage, I actually moved in as a... Uh, a member of the family. Well, in those days, uh, you know, the teachers and coaches, they will go the extra mile to find out about uh, the athletes or the students that they are coaching and what have you. They will take that extra effort to make it a point to see to their interests. When I was a kid, I noticed that he used to stand in front of the canvas for sometimes half a day with all the paintbrush and so on, the canvas already there and the sketch behind him, next to it, without painting. He was just standing there thinking about what he would like to do, how to express it and so on. 
the sketches uh, of me. He actually carries his sketchbook very often, and whenever he saw something that is uh, very uh, Singapore, he would do so. The topics are very wide-ranging, from portrait to scenery to still life, and sometimes even uh, buildings themselves. He actually painted the world around him all his life. Now, this is the last one. Also. Yeah, that's me again. Yeah, pretending to be studious. Well, my father Liu Kang wanted to be able to be in touch with his own emotion and his own thinking. He did not just record the images, he put his personal interpretation to what he saw. And that makes it um, not just a photograph, it's a painting. In uh, Chinese paintings, some of the artistic value, like uh, the important one is like the ichi orchard. That means you produce your painting in one breath and it's completed. If you look at the painting, they look very spontaneous. But actually behind the spontaneity, there's a lot of thinking behind it. When I started, we were actually called the Mad John family, and my father was called Crazy Akau, Mad Akau. We would drive up to Chinese Swimming Club, which had a low wall. It had a low retaining wall around the swimming pool. We'd drive our car up to the wall. My brother would get up on the bonnet of the car. Then I would get on top of his shoulders and jump over. Mind you, on the other side, there were no lights. And we would literally swim in the dark. You know, I have many scars to show for, sort of, you know, when you hit the wall and it starts to bleed. And so it was the dedication that got into this. Like, we were nuts, <laughs> honestly, but it was worth it. I trained six times a week, and it was always after my duty in school. I was also a PE teacher as well as a classroom teacher and a maths teacher as well as an English teacher. And when you are an English teacher, you have one week comprehension, one week composition, and it's never ending. So I would go home, have my lunch, and then lie in bed, mark a few books, and then feel sleepy, sleep for a while, get up, still early, mark a few more books, and then go for training. At about 6, 6, 15, 6, 30, the pool guy would come in, stir up lime powder and chlorine, and you could see it was smoking like this, you know, just... And he would just pour it into the swimming pool. And were we brave, we would look at this thing getting poured in, and it was just hissing and bubbling, and then we'd get in the same pool. And of course, our hair was going to be... It was like straw. And if we didn't cut it off, then it would turn green. We didn't have swim goggles in those days. We would see double. So I would say the first half of every morning in school, I saw nothing. During the Pesha Sukan, it had to fall on uh, my wedding day. My husband and I rushed to the registrar of marriages signed our papers, got married, and then he had to drive me back to Girls Sports Club to play our match. That was, uh, that, that was the most ridiculous thing, I think, you know, but <laughs> on hindsight, you know, but at that point of time, you know, it was the thing that I had to do, you know, for the team, because if I did not turn up for the game, then who is going to take my place in the team, you see? <laughs> that was how committed I was, you know, to the team at that time. The 
details. Make sure you pay attention to every detail. Where your right foot is, where your left foot is, your hands, your shoulders. Again! So when can you start? I don't know if I can do this. What are you talking about? You're amazing. Look at Muifang and Siti. They're here at training because of what you did to convince their parents. You're going to be a good coach, baby. And you know that. So what's stopping you? You can't be the hair salon, right? You're a lousy hairdresser compared to your mother. Oi! I lost it, Rani. Remember the inter-school games during Sec 4? We were tied with PLMGS until I lost. So did I. I came in fourth in 100 meters and if I'm not mistaken, Marjorie got disqualified from hurdles. A whole bunch of us lost the day, BB. Not just you. But you all are different. You all can lose, wake up the next morning and find confidence all over again. But I... I feel like a loser. I've been feeling like that for a very long time. Go back to your hair salon, Vivi. Back to starting position. What we need to learn is to use our discretion and give ourselves more latitude. Why are we so afraid of failing? I mean, let's, let's be honest. I didn't succeed with all those medals, right? Without failing, we failed quite a bit. It's just that those were the things that weren't reported or talked about. But you can bet for every success, there's, there was a mountain of failure that happened. A lot of everything that we are, the fabric of who we are, champions, a lot of it had to do with software, it had to do with heart and hope, you know, mental, uh, uh, emotional um, support. At the end of the day, it doesn't come easy. You need to have the whole gamut of things to, to be supported or to make you successful. One look at that painting, it showed on her face the kind of determination that she is out there to prove to everybody that she can do whatever you think that she can't do, she will prove you wrong. And it gives me, you know, the feeling that whatever anybody can do, especially male, the women can do just as well. I think the big name in 1965, Seb Games, was Pat Chan, the swimmer. You know, we, we couldn't believe that she could get eight gold medals. Oh, she was the golden girl of the pool. You know, the very first in the tradition of champions, right? The very first, uh, the most B-medaled uh, swimmer ever. She was only 11 years old. She came from a family of swimming champions, the Chan family. They were the pride of Singapore, that's for sure, in the swimming pool. The story was I was a minority in my family. I was the only girl. I had brothers which were always, you know, I was the only lone Indian and they were the cowboys with the bullets. So for me, it was always a different motivation. The motivation was always, whatever I do, I do it well. If not, don't waste my time. That kind of thing. And my dad used to say, you know, do it well, don't waste my time. At the end of that, the thing that occurred to me wasn't so much of, oh, this is going to be big. It was more like, oh my gosh, how am I going to top this? What am I going to do next? Because now people will expect a lot more. And that, in a way, was, was the dynamo that kept me going for a long time. 
there are a lot of people who, in those days, attributed just about all of my success um, to my father. And, and the short answer is, listen, it's a collaboration because I'm the one who gets out there and does the thing. And it was very interesting because my father was always in the pictures with me, but my mum was always the one who did all that supportive work. And a lot of people do not know that when we then began to have a lot more sort of concept of having team, and team had uniforms, and uniforms are inspiring because they made you want to belong. The person behind all that was my mum, whether at club level or on a national level. It was she who designed a lot of our uniforms. Strangely enough, we're still wearing the same colours and almost the same look today. Her, her expression of creativity it was really very, very clever. And I remember in the 70s, she had boots in red made for us with zips, you know, and we turned up at the Olympics in my, and my dad and I would always, we always had this joke, cannot win gold medals, never mind, we will look great. We did. In the beginning, they laugh at me. No, they think, why this women? Why women have to do all these things when they can stay at home? I told them, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, uh, I said, we should start netball association here. Then she said, it's a good idea, but you have to do it on your own. There's nobody going to help you. You have no money, nothing. So I went ahead and I, I was being teased, being jeered, saying, why you women want to follow the men? No doubt, it was very, very, very difficult. But the determination to succeed, to get on well, that, that's what I, I want to achieve. I was determined to start netball here. When Mrs. Tan Yunin wanted to form the association, you know, we, she, she just roped us in, the teachers, you know. And that was how we got, got, got it started, you see. The initial years of the association, we were not that fortunate. We had to actually raise our own funds. We used to sell pencils, you know, to commercial firms. We had to do cookie sales, you know. We had to hold fun fairs to raise money, you know. So these were all the things that we had to go through in those days just to represent Singapore. We played because we loved the game. And we played the game because we are proud to represent Singapore. I first encountered Mrs. Tan Yun Yin as president of the Singapore Women's Hockey Association. Mrs. Tan Yun Yin scared the bejeebies out of me sometimes because she was so strict about um, the way you behaved on the field. So there was a tournament where I was very upset that um, the Malaysians, they, they, they hantam your, your leg, etc. And I was really upset and I walked off the field without uh, acknowledging the captain of the Malaysian side. That evening, she went to my room and she called me out and she said, that was not good sportsmanship. I'd like you now to go to the captain and apologise for your behaviour, because I was 13. Of course, you know, at that time, you know, and then I apologised, but I can see now why it had to be done. And ever since that time, I have never, ever done that, because she explained to me why it had to be done. That the, that the game, uh, the sport, is not just about winning or losing. Each is about who you are, and it reveals who you are as a person. So I would remember her for that. I was angry for a few years, but then as you sit down and you think about it, um, yeah, I, I, would, I know what it, what it means to play sport now and what sport does for you. And here we see the athletes all liberating up for the start of the women's 1500 metres. And in that field is Singapore's pride and joy, Kay Jayamani. This is the final for the women's 1500 meters in the 10th Southeast Asian Games here in Jakarta. And there they go. As usual, Jayamani is with the lead group, but not right at the front. She's facing herself. She's got plenty of reserves in the tank. Thanks to the training of her coach. Okay. 
你拿这个东西去哪里？哎呀，你卖差啦！喂、哦，这些东西不是你的。什么？搞大事去啊！你看有人在，我不会打你哎。哎，阿伟哥，我，我看啊，这些店的风水很假啦，所以我每次打麻将都不会赢钱的。我跟你讲，我现在不是在拿，只是借。等我赢了钱之后，我会把全部赎回来。什么？你要丢我？丢我？丢我？你拿呢？全部都拿去。反正我赚的每一分钱都拿去。我要把这家店关掉。笑。从现在开始，我做什么都不关你的事。Mmm. -hmm. 